series today. And so if you want to join me in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 4, I'm actually going to jump around a little bit this morning in Matthew, as well as a couple other places, but primarily in Matthew, and we're going to start in chapter 4. Uh, while you're turning there, you may or may not know this. If this is news to you, I have, you know, sorry to be, you know, kind of bringing you up to date, but this is, you know, hopefully this isn't shocking. Uh, but there's an election coming up. And uh, that's a reality, and we have different feelings about that. Um, and I really think that the feelings of how sometimes some of us can feel about the election currently and moving toward it are wrapped up in this video clip I want to show you this morning. The clip is from a movie that came out in the late 90s uh, called Election, and it's a, about a high school student body election. And at one point in the film, these high school students who were nominated for the position of student body president have to get up in front of the entire student body in an assembly and give their pitch as far as why people should vote for them. And so this clip that I want to show you is one of the candidates' speech on the election. People! People! Who cares about this stupid election? We all know it doesn't matter who gets elected president of Carver. But do you really think it's going to change anything around here? Make one single person smarter or happier or nicer? The only person it does matter to is the one who gets elected. The same pathetic charade happens every year. And everyone makes the same pathetic promises just so they can put it on their transcripts to get into college. So vote for me, because I don't even want to go to college, and I don't care. And as president, I won't do anything. The only promise I will make is that, if elected, I will immediately dismantle the student government so that none of us will ever have to sit through one of these stupid assemblies again. strongly, very strongly, that we do need to care about this election, and I do think that you should vote. But I think that this clip captures very well the exhaustion and the angst that people can have about the election, the frustration with the lack of civility, and a sense of just being over it with, a lot of, with the whole thing. In fact, an August NBC Wall Street Journal poll found this. Despite Americans' overall satisfaction with the state of the U.S. economy and their own personal finances, a majority say that they are angry at the nation's political and financial establishment, anxious about its economic future, and pessimistic about the country they're leaving for the next generation. The election may be exhausting and even feel a little bit hopeless, but it's not going anywhere. In fact, according to advertising analytics, $6.7 billion could be spent on this election cycle alone. So even more talk is coming. More opinions are going to be shared. More input is going to be provided as we head toward November 3rd. And so how is the church supposed to respond to all of this? How do we engage the current climate? How do we process the election? What is the church to think when we see our country in its current state? Is the church able to admit it when we are right there with the culture, in the division, the anxiety, and the pessimism, rather than being people of unity, peace, and joy? What opportunities are before us and what pitfalls do we need to be wary of? as we think about everything going on. These are the questions we want to be thinking about and asking in this new series we're starting today called Citizens. 
The Bible explains that somebody following Jesus is part of his kingdom. And so in this series, we're going to talk about what does that mean? What does that look like? Especially in light of everything going on. Now, a few guidelines, parameters, principles, disclaimers, however you want to call it, that I want to establish before we begin. Not just for today, but for these next three weeks. For always, but I really want to emphasize them in this series. I am coming at this as your pastor, and pastors need to address topics like this. The mentality that you should just stick to talking about Jesus and the gospel and don't talk about politics and faith, that's a very compartmentalized way of thinking because Jesus influences everything. And so we need to be talking about topics like this. We just need to look at them biblically. Second, I am going to come fully 100% resonating with Martin Luther King when he said this. I feel someone must refrain in the, excuse me, I feel like someone must remain in the position of non-alignment so that he can look objectively at both parties and be the conscience of both, not the servant or master of either. So this is how I'm approaching this. This is how I always approach this topic. I am not and nor will I ever endorse a candidate, a party, or a platform. I am not going to elevate red over blue, Democrat over Republican, progressive over conservative, or vice versa. I'm not going to espouse any political solution, idea, or policy as being the only Christian way, part of God's party, or the obvious choice. I'm going to focus on biblical truth about the identity and life of the kingdom. And then you need to determine what that looks like in your conscience as you follow Jesus. So I just want to understand where I'm coming from. But let's together pray for our church, for our country, for an awareness of God's presence and his rule, and that he would speak to us this morning. Let's pray together. God, we do come before you so grateful for the fact that you are present, for so grateful for the fact that you are in control, for the grateful for the fact that you love, that you are gracious and merciful, and that you're just. The God, that you are good. God, I pray that you would teach us and show us, convict us and challenge us, God, on what it means to be your people, what it means to be your church, what it means to be citizens of your kingdom. God, I pray you'd help us Help make us uncomfortable with truth, to, that we would be moved toward obedience and faithfulness and a desire to make you known. God, I pray that, Spirit, you would move in this place, that you would draw us more and more close to you and in sync with you, that we would be people after your character and your heart. And so we pray that you would do what only you can do and you would speak, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Now the entire point of these next three weeks, all the entire series can be summarized with this one statement. To follow Jesus is to be a citizen of a different land. Now, that's it, right? No, no, we need to unpack that a little bit more. But this is really it. This is what we're going to be talking about. This is the next three weeks. And really everything that we always talk about is this. But this is the main idea of this series. To follow Jesus is to be a citizen of a different land. We are made to be part of his kingdom. The Bible talks about this a lot, all over the place. For example, it says in Philippians 3.20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Colossians 1, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in Ephesians 2, it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are meant to be citizens of a different land. Now, I know hearing the idea of kingdom, the kingdom of God, that we can start thinking about other things like Queen Elizabeth or the court of Camelot or Lord help us the worst medieval times. Then, and we would be completely missing the point if this is what we thought about. What is the kingdom of God? 
It is to take on a new identity. It means that we are under Jesus' leadership, following his way of life, identifying with him. And so because of that, it creates a tension in how we live because we are citizens of his kingdom while living as citizens of this country. And so an understanding of our identity as kingdom people or what Jesus is calling people to if you're not following him, I would say is the most important issue to consider, not only in processing the election, but in everything. Let me say that again. A person's identity, who they are in Jesus, is the most important topic to consider in how you live your life because it guides our discernment, our choices, our actions, how we live every second of our lives. And so if our identity as kingdom citizens is of, what is, a, is of what's of most importance, what does it look like to be a citizen of his kingdom? Well, first is this. Kingdom citizens have given their allegiance to Jesus. Kingdom citizens have given their allegiance to him. The first time I ever traveled internationally, I had to get a passport. A passport serves as the ultimate proof of citizenship. The law states that a U.S. passport is only granted to a person owing their allegiance to the United States. Now, in his book, Ally, written by Michael Oren, he's the former U.S. Israeli ambassador, he tells the story of entering the embassy of the U.S. to the state of Israel in 2009 to present his passport. But he wasn't coming to present his passport for renewal or anything like that. Michael Oren, who had been raised here in the country and grew up here, but um, had Jewish uh, um, family, was going to become an Israeli citizenship, uh, Israeli citizen. And so he was coming on this day to, to give up his U.S. citizenship. The U.S. Consul General had Oren repeat after him in this process that he went through. I absolutely and entirely renounce my United States nationality together with all the rights and privileges and all the duties and allegiance and fidelity thereunto pertaining. I'm renouncing everything of what it means to be a U.S. citizen as I then bego- become a citizen of a different country. He explains that the affidavit that he signed reaffirmed the extremely serious and irrevocable nature of this act of renunciation. He says, I was acknowledging that I would become an alien with respect to the United States. When we think about the gospel and we think about the good news of Jesus and when we think about what it means to follow him, this illustrates what Jesus is demanding of people that we would renounce our old identities and put allegiance in him. That we would renounce everything that we've held on to for our identity. And we would find identity in him. He calls us to repent. It says in Matthew 4, 17, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, repent. That there's an, the idea of repent is to realign. Now, there's definitely an idea of remorse about wrongdoing within there, but to only think about remorse does not get to the depth of the charge that Jesus is making. Think about how we find value, how we find worth, what we look to, look to in order to give life meaning and purpose. Jesus tells us, turn away from all of those things, repent of those things, And come and find meaning in me. Come and find worth and value in me. Come and find who you are in me. Tim Keller once said, Modern society has no tools for admitting or dealing with the reality of how messed up human beings are. That's the thing. For the person that says, man, look around at all this bad stuff. Look at all these things. There can't be a God. Okay, well, all that stuff is still happening. Whose fault is it then? It's humanities. We see the reality of how messed up the world is. We see the the reality of how messed up our cultures and our cities and our communities are because we keep doing stuff. 
the reality and the consequences of sin, the brokenness that comes into our, our world and our culture is a kind of count of the fallenness of humankind. And we have not done anything to make that better. We haven't done anything to remove that. We haven't done anything to take care of that. We have no answers and fixes for the brokenness of humanity. And so we need to look to Jesus because it's only in Jesus that we get to the root of the problem, which is sin. And Jesus forgives sin. He, he takes it all on himself. He took all of our sin and all of the wretchedness, all that removes us from God on himself so that that penalty could be paid so he could put his righteousness upon us. In the power of the resurrection, he invites us into a new life where we're given joy and hope and purpose and meaning in him. That is the answer for everything our heart is craving. He is the one for everything that our hearts are longing for. And as Augustine said, our hearts will continue to be restless until they rest in him. And so we need to look to him for life. We need to look to him for identity. Nothing else. Think about what David Platt says addressing this. He says this, To be sure, Jesus and his kingdom are very different from the kingdoms of this world. While the kingdoms of this world are built on appeasing and catering to the crowds, Jesus calls his followers to count the cost of following him. The road to Jesus' kingdom is paved not by political hostility, but by spiritual humility. Entrance into Jesus' kingdom comes not by asserting yourself, but by denying yourself. Kingdom citizens are those who have denied themselves and given their allegiance to Jesus. What are the implications of that for us? As we think about everything going on right now and how we process everything going on in our culture with the election, and again, everything, what are the implications of this allegiance? Well, first, our allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus and not to the United States or any culture, country that you're from. It doesn't mean that you can't be grateful for and proud of your country. It doesn't mean that you, you, are, you can't be glad that you live here. But we are followers of Jesus first and foremost and Americans second, not the other way around. We need to evaluate what it means to be American by our identity as kingdom people. We don't interpret our faith based on what it means to be American. Listen to what one of the early church fathers said about everything people held dear during their time compared to Jesus. Paul says in Philippians, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, garbage, in order that I might gain Christ. So if you were to compare your political party of choice to kingdom citizenship, which would you see as garbage compared to the other? If you compared U.S. citizenship to kingdom citizenship, which would win your heart? Because Paul was the guy that could check all the boxes. He had the resume better than everyone. He was as Jewish as a Jewish guy could be. This was the man that mothers would look at their kids and go, you need to be like him. And Paul is saying it's all garbage compared to knowing Jesus. Is that how we feel about our political identity, our government identity, who we are as Americans compared to Jesus? Or do we think that they're the same thing? Or God help us, do we put patriotism over faith? Think about the song that we sing. Which is better, Jesus or anything else? Justin Gibbonani's, I think that's how you say his name, Gibbonani, Gibbonani, that will say it like that. There is no single Christian policy or political platform. To act like there is one or to wish that there was one would be to make the old mistake of thinking that the kingdom of God is like human kingdoms. Kingdom citizenship is not the same as patriotism. Jesus must be first. The other implication for our allegiance of Jesus is that our identity is secure in Jesus, 
not a political election. Again, quoting Gibboni. Gibboni, I'm going to mess that up every time. We already have the ultimate victory, which is our salvation and the kingdom that God has promised. Nothing in this world is comparable to our inheritance and the kingdom of God. No political ideology can replace the kingdom, nor does the kingdom of God rely on the political plans and priorities. The kingdom is secure. Regardless of who wins this next election, the kingdom is secure. No one needs to save Christianity. Our faith is okay regardless of who wins this next election. The idea of the idea that Christianity needs to be saving is ridiculous because Jesus is on the throne and no one that wins this election, regardless of who that is, is going to change that. Regardless of who wins this election, he is there and our identity in him is secure. Anyone offering an end-of-the-world scenario for what could happen if their candidate doesn't win is not thinking like a rational faith in Jesus mindset because our security is not in the election. It's in Jesus. So you have to ask yourself, who is your allegiance in? Who has your heart? Who would you champion and be passionate and faithful to amongst everything else? Which means you're willing to criticize and speak, criti and speak truth and love to something because of who you are in Jesus. Where is your heart's allegiance? Kingdom citizens have given their allegiance to Jesus. The second thing, kingdom citizens embrace the ethics of the kingdom. Kingdom citizens embrace the ethics of the kingdom. There is no, there was no such thing as the separation of church and state in Jesus' time. Even though this is a big part of our world today, even though I feel like it's greatly misunderstood and misused, this was not a concept when Jesus walked the earth. There was the Jewish establishment, mindset, priorities, and culture. There was the Roman establishment, mindset, priorities, and culture. But the idea of one being political and one being Jewish or those, uh, spiritual or that those were separated, it would not compute in their mindset. It was all together and it was all connected. And so in a basic sense, each had an identity that included a way of life. That's what an ethic is. An ethic is based on who we are, we live this way. And so if I'm saying my allegiance is in Jesus, then I have to live the way of Jesus, the ethics of Jesus. And that's what Jesus invites us into, to live according to his teaching, to his ethic. It says in the Sermon on the Mount, constantly in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it taught this way. You've heard it explained this way. They've always keep going on like this, but here's the truth of the kingdom. I know it was said this way, but here's how I want you to be. And typically making it harder, more strict, more real, more committed. I want you to really not just go with this kind of one or two. I want you to be all in in this manner. Elsewhere, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the image of the yoke was an, an, an image from animals, but it wasn't just about who we're tethered to and things like that. This was an image of the law. Summarizing the Zondervan background commentary, it says, when somebody carried a yoke, they carried it on their shoulders. And Judaism applied this image of subjection to obedience. Jewish people spoke of carrying the yoke of God's law and the yoke of God's kingdom. That yoke was taken on and carried by acknowledging God and keeping his commandments. So what is Jesus saying? Come and take my ethic upon you. Take my way of life on you. And my way of life is not a burden to you. My way of life will give you rest. My way of life, the ethic that I'm giving you, will bring re rest for those who labor and are heavy laden. Jesus calls people to live this new ethic. He tells them 
at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The person who follows Jesus did not just have a day where they prayed a prayer. The person who follows Jesus is building their life, establishing their life on his teachings in sync with his character to represent who he is. Now we're going to talk more about this idea of the ethic of the kingdom as we process issues next week. But what are some implications for us as we think about our identity? Well, first off, if we're to embrace the king, ex- ethics of the kingdom, that means we have to evaluate everything through that lens. Everything that we do has to be evaluated through the lens of the kingdom. Jesus came into the world to bear witness to the truth. He's our North Star. Accordingly, as Christians, our mission is to follow his example and spread his truth no matter the cost. This mission extends into our political engagement, which must always be founded on God's truth. The Bible is the absolute standard for truth and moral order. What it says is good is good. What it says is righteous is righteous. All other statements of truth must be judged according, base, excuse me, must be judged based on the biblical standard. In our polarized political climate, It is incredibly easy just to slap a label onto an issue, a person, a situation, and then to accept them or reject them based on the label. If I can put Republican on you or Democrat on you, if I can put politically conservative or politically liberal, if I can slap that label on you, then just based on that label, I can say, well, then that's good and that's wrong. That's how it should be and that's how it shouldn't be. Just purely based on the fact that I can put that label on somebody. But here's the problem. Labels create lazy thinkers. Labels create lazy thinkers because no believer should be 100% comfortable in either political party because we're not supposed to be evaluating everything based on a party stance or an ideology. We're supposed to be evaluating things based on the kingdom of God. And there's things that we're evaluating based on the kingdom of God that we would look at within whatever label and go, that isn't in line with the kingdom. It it is okay to have political convictions. It's okay to feel that you resonate with one of the political parties. But to think that they have a a monopoly on truth and spiritual faithfulness and the other is just the opposite is not appropriate thinking. That is not how it works. If you simply take everything that one particular label has as correct or approved by God, then you are equating partiology with kingdom righteousness. And that is wrong. If the only thing that we can do is criticize the shortcomings of one group without owning up to the same in our own, then we are equating party ideology with kingdom righteousness, and that is wrong. There are things about both concepts that, yeah, we can look at and go, that is in line with Jesus. But there are also things in both things that are far from the reality of the kingdom of God. And so we have to evaluate first and foremost, think, think, Just because it has a label on it doesn't mean it's in line with the kingdom of God. And that leads into the second thing of why this is so important, why we have to evaluate based on the ethics of the kingdom and not by labels, is we must be unified in our kingdom identity, not separated by political differences. Within all that I've read, the books and articles and everything from the last couple of weeks, the one thing that has blown me away more than anything is the breakdown of who holds to what political party in the United States. According to the Pew Research Group, Gallup, at the end of August, actually, excuse me, at the end of September, when asked the question in politics as of today, do you consider yourself a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent? 28% said Republican, 
27% said Democrat, and 42% said Independent. Out of everything, this was the moment for me, because the way that all of these things are talked about in our country, you would think that it was 48% one, 48% the other, and four people that are independent. But that's not how it works. This is the breakdown in our country. And here's the thing I want you to think about. Which one of these columns has the people that love Jesus in it? All of them. Which one of these columns have people that are passionate about Jesus? All of them. Which one of these columns has people that want to see the kingdom spread? All of them. Which one of these has people that need to know Jesus and see Jesus and hear him in other people's lives? All of them. So how we go about interacting with one another matters. It means that you will have other Jesus followers who vote differently than you. You will have other Jesus followers who rev resonate with a different political ideology than you. And that is okay. This is one of those moments when I really have to emphasize speaking the truth in love. If you think less of a person because they vote differently than you, if you question a person's faith or faithfulness because they lean a different way politically than you, if you feel like you can't go to church with people who are politically different than you, you need to seek God's forgiveness for your pride and idolatry because you are putting political ideology above the kingdom of God, and we are meant to be known for our love for one another, not for how we vote. Are you hearing me? This is, why, this is where the whole label things comes into play, because believers in Jesus will slap a label on different topics, on different things, and then go, ah, oh, stupid Democrats, dumb Republicans, those are people that need Jesus. Those are other people who say they love Jesus. They're all made in his image. And how dare we slander somebody simply because they think politically different than we do. That's the problem, is that we don't realize that behind every label is a person. And the thing is, is if all we care about is the temporal vote that a person will cast, and not their eternal destiny. We have made politics and patriotism idolatry and above the kingdom. And that is something we need to repent of. That is the failure of the American church right now. And we need to own up to that. There are people who are created in God's image who are not hearing about him because they're being insulted or they're seeing how Christians act rather than disagreeing respectfully, rather than correcting respectfully. We need to do better at this. We are going to lean, again, we're going to lean more into this topic next week, but the question has to be asked, what defines why you do what you do? I know, I mean, we're talking about this issue right now, and if you've been around here a lot, you've heard me say different things or post different things or... But, Everything that I do and everything that I say, so you understand where I'm coming from, is from this issue. Because I know people who are struggling with the gospel, who are struggling with the church, who are questioning whether it's all a sham or it's a real thing, and their biggest reason to be turned off is how they see Christians talking about these issues, how they see Christians engaging one another, and how they see Christians talking about the world. So when you see me comment or make posts or talk, I don't care about a political party or a vote or election. I want to see the kingdom advance. And I'm tired of seeing the church act like idiots. I mean that with a lot of love and truth. We have to stop talking like the world and start being the people that we're made to be in the image of God. And those who say they love Jesus need to be better at this. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to have healthy debate. But shame on us. Shame any person that has made the comment, stupid Democrats, dumb Republicans, how dare we talk? about people made in the image of God. 
in that way? Why do you do what you do? Is it for Jesus or a political party? Culture or kingdom? These first two points are the two most important points Christian must wrestle with. And we have to own up to our failures within that. That the church today is seen today for being as po- politically, excuse me, polarized politically as the culture means that we are emulating the values of the culture and not the values of the kingdom. That's why we should be concerned with this. That the fact that the church is as polarized politically as the rest of the world means that the church is living the world's values. Because if we were living kingdom values, it would not be this way. It would not look the way it looks. It's not a, anything, a commentary on our country. It's a commentary on the church. And we need to repent. And we need to live and be unified around the gospel. Oh, be, acknowledge our differences, but be united around the gospel. We have to own it. Because that leads to the last thing. Kingdom citizens are called to recruit new kingdom citizens. Our allegiance is in him. We're following his ethic. And kingdom citizens are called to recruit new kingdom citizens. It amazes me sometimes how much Jesus entrusts us with. We actually talked about this last week, if you weren't with us, but it's true. Jesus' plan, Jesus' plan A for telling the world about himself is the citizens of his kingdom. And there is no plan B. (laughs) He entrusts us with the ministry of reconciliation. And so how we go about life matters. He calls kingdom people to recruit new kingdom people. It says in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is where the replication takes place, baptizing them, helping people understand the need to renounce, repent of their other lives, and put their allegiance in Jesus, teaching them, not living the ethics of the culture, but living the ethics of Jesus. Politicians rely on debates and commercials and emails and posts and phone calls and occasionally yard signs. Jesus relies on the life and words of his followers. Jesus relies on how we go about our lives. He cares about how you talk with people and engage people. He doesn't really care about that verse that you posted with the colorful artwork. He's not looking for you to wear the Christian t-shirt. He wants you to live his ethic, his kingdom, his heart, his character, and let people see him through you. That's what he's talking about in Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus is talking to us about engaging the culture, being in it and not of it. And how do we go about this idea of being the salt and light of the world? Well, think about reading Yelp reviews for a restaurant or establishment or anything. This is actually our Yelp score. We're currently setting at 4.5 stars. The reason why we don't have a perfect score is that we got a low rating one time because somebody said we were too nice. I'll take it. That's okay. That was, that, but that's a true story. You can look it up yourself. But what do you do when you read a Yelp review? What are we pointing out? We're pointing out the food and the atmosphere. How did the food taste and what did you experience? Jesus tells us that we're the salt and light of the earth. We create the God experience for people in this culture. We bring the taste of life with him and the light of his character to a bland, dark world. And so see how we live matters. How we engage politics matters. How we talk about it matters. How we post about it matters. How we disagree matters. How we lead matters. The arguments we make and the counterarguments we make matters. It all matters. Justifying slander or compromise for political messaging or gain is nothing short of sin. Justin Gibney said, Our civic participation will not glorify God if it's placed above worship, evangelism, or Christian fellowship. Again, Christians more concerned about a temporal vote instead of people's eternal home is nothing short of an embarrassment of Jesus' kingdom. We do need to talk about this. We will disagree. 
that we can do that well. And so you have to be honest with yourself. Who is someone that you need to apologize to for how you've handled the disagreement? Do you need to post an apology for your insensitivity or slander that you've used? Have you, be, have you been too sensitive or felt like that you were being attacked when someone was just speaking truth to you and maybe you need to evaluate some things? Kingdom citizens are to recruit new ones. Who is somebody you're praying for, inviting, engaging about faith? Because if not, why? That should be like the main thing. Kingdom people are meant to recruit new kingdom people. Whether this election cycle or anything else, we are first and foremost kingdom citizens. He has our allegiance, we follow his ethic, and we make new kingdom citizens. Everything else comes back to this. Next week, we're going to talk about how to evaluate different issues in light of this identity and ethic. But last week, we're going to talk about how do we engage others, people who disagree with us, people that have... uh, that need to hear the truth of the gospel. How do we engage and talk to people in this world about these things? But it first and foremost starts with this. Who are you? And where do you find your identity? We're going to close by receiving communion this morning. And if there, there was never a more potent and appropriate time to receive communion than it's a conversation about our identity in Christ. Uh, Don't open this little thing yet. We're going to take a moment. Um, If you've never received communion with us, one of the things that we always do, just take a moment of quiet, a moment of quiet to prayerfully be in the presence of the Lord, to allow him to speak to our hearts as as we just think about feeding on the truth of his word. What do we need to bring in? What do we need to uh, receive from him? Maybe it's something about our allegiance. Maybe it's something about how we're going about our lives. Maybe it's the how we're engaging others and sharing the good news. Maybe we need to confess something. Maybe we just need to be quiet and let him speak to us. But we always take a moment of just prayerful quiet to hear from the Lord before we receive communion. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't don't take communion right now. Communion is for those who have put their faith in Jesus, who are acknowledging and remembering what he's done. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you don't need to take communion. You need to Put your faith in Jesus. And the beauty of this, the opportunity that this scenario of being on site and online has showed us is that you don't have to be in a specific place for that to happen. You don't need to go to a specific person to make that happen. You need to come to Jesus. Acknowledging that all the different things that you try to find your identity in will not do what your heart is craving. And it's only his work on the cross and the power of his resurrection, the life that he gives us, the victory that he invites us into, that's what gives us the life our hearts are craving for. And you you need to acknowledge your need for him. Acknowledge the work that he's done for you. And say, Jesus, I am giving my life to you. I am putting the allegiance of my life in you. I am trusting you for life. That's what you need to do this morning. And so whatever it is, just come to the Lord together in quiet. And after a minute, we'll receive communion together. And so God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would penetrate our distractions and our denials and the things that we put up against you and that we could just hear from you. I pray that your word would ring true in our hearts and ears. We would hear from you in this moment, Spirit. Let's be quiet before him.
you stand with me? We'll receive communion together. If you've never done communion with us or with one of these things, just to give you a little coaching here, there's two flaps. There's a clear one and a silver one. Uh, take this clear one off first. That'll take off, that'll open up the uh, delicious wafer to you. And then, um, and then when you're ready to take the juice, you'd pull up the silver. I wouldn't pull it up all the way, just enough to drink it. And um, just a little bit of guidance there. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for your broken body. We're grateful for your shed blood. God, we're grateful for the fact of all of your loving work on the cross that you've done in our place. God, we're grateful for the life that you give us through the power of the resurrection, that you conquered sin, you conquered death. We're grateful for the victory that we share with you that you've given us identity, that you've made us sons and daughters, that you have united us not only with you, with one another. God, I pray that you would cement these ideas of who we are, our identity in you, into our hearts. Let this be the thing that guides us. Let this be the thing that that directs us as we go through not only these issues, but every step of life. Forgive us for the times, God, when we turn away from you. We're grateful for reminders of the cross. Reminders of the empty too, because we need to remember who you are and who we are in you. Again, we are so grateful for your sacrifice made on our behalf that we can celebrate together and remember all that you've done. Let's receive communion together. for your broken body. We're grateful for your shed blood, for the life that we have in you. You are Lord. You rule. And we submit to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we think about the the power of the cross and resurrection, of all that Jesus has done for us, the life that we have in him. We want to end just celebrating that. Let's just sing out in this last worship song.